Okay, so um, more the next, networks. yes, exactly. <laughs> the next speaker is Marco Marco Bertini. He works at the University of Florence, and uh, he's going to to talk about high quality video experience using deep ne ne neural networks. So all yours. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, how many of you are fans of Game of Thrones? Uh, have you watched it? Uh, yeah, me too. And uh, you remind there has been uh, quite uh, some uh, discussion about uh, the famous episode uh, about the long night because uh, it was very, very dark and uh, many scenes uh, were not really visible uh, when you experienced it watching uh, through streaming. Uh, and uh, yeah, as, it, as you can see here, Okay, the background uh, behind, uh, behind uh, the character is uh, not as smooth as you expect in a real image. You can see an effect that is called posterization. It's due to the high quantization of the background, and so you see very large swaths of uh, solid color that is not natural. If you look uh, at the walls behind you, they don't look like this. And uh, yeah, people was asking uh, why it was so dark, why it was bad, uh, why it was a disappointment. And uh, they spent a lot of money in order to produce uh, all the computer graphics of the battle scenes. But uh, they were basically lost to the viewers. And why does it happen still now? I mean, we have been promised uh, large bandwidth, uh, fiber connections, uh, 5G. The matter is that streaming videos is uh, still expensive. This is just a back of the envelope count that, just to have an idea, we made. Uh, we look at that, uh, Stranger Things, and the first ep episode of season two was watched by 15 million viewers. And uh, if you look at the um, uh, Amazon Cloud outbound traffic costs, you go around uh, yeah, two cents per gigabyte. But overall, given uh, the millions of uh, viewers, you can think that the cost of streaming just one episode for one time is around $1 million. Probably Netflix has better prices than this. <laughs> Let's say that you are going to pay this amount of money to start now. But still, it's a quite large sum. Therefore, if you want to stream videos, you have to compress them. And compressing them introduces artifacts visual artifacts that, that are unpleasant for the viewer, as it has happened for Game of Thrones. How can we fix it? We have an idea. Uh, this is, on the left, you can see what is stored inside the, the library of the streamer. Perhaps we can think of compressing it so that streaming does not cost too much. We send the very compressed stream through the internet. And on the user side, there is a neural network that reconstructs the original high quality image. So in this case, everybody's happy. The streamer pays less. The viewer watches something in high quality. This problem is somewhat similar to what was shown to us uh, during the first keynote uh, uh, here, we are not trying to recover the real shape of galaxies in order to measure the shape. It's something easier. We are trying to recover a high-quality image from a low-quality image that was created from another high-quality image, the original image, through a compression uh, algorithm, the famous codex. So our idea is to get the image on the left with those, you see, with those uh, um, uh, artifacts like uh, the high quality the um, high frequency artifacts uh, on, on on that angel or all that noise on the winged lion and reconstruct the image on the right you can see that uh, there are no more uh, high frequency artifacts near the borders uh, of the shapes so this is our problem and in order to invert this process our idea is to use uh, uh, a deep neural network, a deep convolutional neural network. So this is a network that can perform uh, this type of reconstruction. The first layers 
uh, basically have a, a duty that is to reduce the number of parameters. So we can't uh, have a network uh, that uh, processes uh, full resolution images. Uh, the number of parameters and it will be too large and the computational cost will be too high. We are recovering the images on the user side, so we have to go as fast as possible. Then we have a set of residual blocks that perform uh, the heavy duty of uh, understanding how to eliminate the artifacts, how to add again the details that were lost in compression. Followed by these, we have uh, some layers that uh, try to smooth out a little bit uh, the outputs of uh, these uh, layers, of, of these uh, residual layers. So uh, the S that you see in the first blocks, it's the stride that says how the convolutions move over the input data and is basically used yeah, to reduce the feature map size. And uh, the upsampling in the red layer basically is done uh, to reduce uh, checkerboard artifacts uh, that may happen during this process. So we can train uh, this network, uh, for example, on patches extracted from uh, one of the many image datasets that exist. Let's say we have used in particular Microsoft Cocoa dataset. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the residual blocks, uh, residual blocks uh, uh, are basically uh, special types of blocks where there is a skip connection that connects uh, the previous layers with the following layers. And uh, this is uh, an incredibly powerful technique uh, because uh, this has given us uh, the family of ResNet networks that have really allowed uh, to train uh, very, very deep uh, neural networks uh, using uh, stacked layers, uh, okay, VGG19, so 19 layers, but with uh, this type of networks you can create layers, uh, networks with 150 layers, for example. Uh, Using this uh, skip connection, it's possible uh, to reduce uh, the, um, basically the vanishing gradient problem. Uh, this is why it allows us uh, to uh, train uh, deeper networks. Uh, just to get uh, some line of pythons in my presentation, uh, here is how you will produce uh, uh, this uh, residual block. Basically, you need uh, to follow, to, uh, we use the TensorFlow and Keras in our lab, uh, you have to use uh, um, the functional style uh, of uh, Keras and TensorFlow because, uh, of course, the sequential modeling uh, doesn't allow you to create the skip layer. So it's basically, this, uh, this is just a simple example of how you create one of those uh, layers. Uh, the squeeze and expand uh, arguments uh, are simply the number of uh, filters uh, that are created in each layer. And. Uh, those of you that are not familiar with TensorFlow, just check perhaps uh, the slides uh, of, of uh, the first uh, tutorial on the first day, and uh, also the presentation of paper was, uh, she introduced this. And uh, just to visualize them, uh, here is uh, how it works. Uh, we go from uh, a wide layer that contains many, many filters, you squeeze them, and then the final layer is uh, again a wide, uh, layer full, uh, with uh, several filters that are learned. How do you train that network? Okay, you could think uh, very simply. Uh, you measure how far is the created image uh, with respect uh, to the original one. You give uh, as an input a compressed image and then you measure. You can measure, for example, uh, each pixel by itself using uh, uh, a mean squared error loss. Uh, but uh, actually, MSC is not a good metric for the human visual system. If you train a network with MSC, the best thing that it learns is, uh, uh, is like smoothing the image. It's uh, just spreading the errors around, so the image will be blurred. Okay, you may think, uh, let's go for another metric that uh, is uh, uh, more, uh, more suitable for the human visual system. Uh, there is a whole line of research on this. Let's use the... Um, Structural, structural Similarity Index, SIM, that is uh, one of the most famous metrics on this. Uh, but still, uh, also with SIM, as you can see here in this image, 
This, on the left, uh, there is the highly compressed image. You see those bad checkerboard artifacts. With SIM, everything is more blurred, but still, blurred images are not very nice to us. Also, look at this one. JPEG compressed image. Look at all those uh, bad checkerboard artifacts. SSIM loss creates a very smooth image, so the fur of the cat is not anymore visible if we compare it to the original image. A little bit trick here is that uh, if you want to use this structural similarity metric, uh, you have to write it down because uh, in Keras uh, you have uh, MSC loss but not SSIM. But SSIM is, uh, is um, differentiable, so you can use it as a loss. So the idea is uh, to use a different training approach uh, that is uh, using a generative adversarial network training. So you can see the GAN uh, image, uh, the second from the right. With this type of training, we can recover the full of the cat, the, the details that are lost if you use structural similarity or any signal-based metric. So generative adversarial network, uh, the idea is uh, we are going to use um, uh, basically a conditional generative adversarial network. Uh, so as an input, uh, we provide to the generator a patch of a low quality image. The generator tries to restore this input, creating the fake uh, image. The high quality image is then fed along with the restored image to the discriminator and the discriminator will tell us after that it has been trained alternatively with the generator if a patch was a high quality or a low quality image. And uh, this means uh, basically that, okay, we are gonna use the generator during uh, training. We are gonna use the discriminator during training in order to fool the discriminator, the generator must become more and more able to restore the image. And then at runtime, at inference time, we will throw away the discriminator and keep the generator network, the one that I've shown you before, to restore images running it on the end user. Uh, if you remind, if you have attended the tutorial on GANs on the first day, uh, remind that uh, in this case, uh, somehow, we can think that the discriminator is designing the loss for us now. So probably this loss that is being learned somehow uh, is uh, more suited, uh, we hope so, it's more suited uh, to be pleasant for the human eye. A little trick for the discriminator, uh, video compression and anyway, pulse image compression is based on compressing patches of the image. So the idea is uh, not to feed the whole image to the discriminator, but uh, go on sub-patches. So we split the original patches into sub-patches so that, and, and, um, and concatenate them, so that the discriminator better learns uh, the correspondences between high quality and low quality images and uh, gets better. We have seen that uh, this let us to eliminate uh, some uh, artifacts that otherwise are, are introduced during the gun training. You can see there is uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, high frequency noise in the background behind the bird. If you add uh, this noise, like here, okay. if you add this noise into a video, you create what is called mosquito noise because the position of this high frequency noise may change from frame to frame, so it will appear like uh, mosquitoes are running <laughs> inside of the video. So it's very, very bad. Okay, let's say that you have trained with this approach that I've told you. Here are some uh, qualitative results. The first, the typical things that is done uh, when you train uh, uh, GANs is uh, providing some qualitative results. So, here you can see a highly compressed JPEG image. We try to recover it using our own approach. It's the green one, GAN. We have compared our approach versus another state-of-the-art approach, the one marked AR-CNN. 
and then you can see the original. Uh, so you can see that uh, also that ARCNN that doesn't use GAN for training blurs the image. You can see especially in the eye or in the fur of the, the opter. But, uh, okay, qualitative results, you show some nice images. Uh, is it good, is it bad? You have cherry picked it, uh, everything is good. So we, the problem here is uh, being able uh, to uh, have uh, sensible measurements. So first task, ask humans what is better. This is extremely expensive, uh, especially in, in terms of time, because you have to collect people, uh, you have uh, to collect the, all, the, um, all the images, uh, and uh, you have to collect many images in order to get the sensible numbers. So here the best line of action is perhaps creating a double stimulus impairment scale that is commonly used to evaluate uh, image quality. So, users are, expect, are expected uh, to rate uh, how a reconstructed image uh, is good uh, is compared to the original. And we show them uh, images that, has been, that have been restored using uh, SSIM, so using a standard training, and uh, images with a gun. And we have observed that it's pretty much sure that according to the mean opinion score of the users, that the gun reconstruction is uh, more pleasant to humans. Of course, this type of experiments is expensive. If you change a little bit your network, you add one more layer, you have to collect uh, some tens of people, have them watch again the images, rate them. It takes days to make this type of experiments anytime you try to change or improve your network. So there are other ways to, uh, to collect uh, these uh, metrics. And uh, for example, a good opportunity is uh, to use uh, no reference image assessment metrics. There, are, there is a number of these type of metrics. So it's uh, just uh, an algorithm that you run. And uh, for example, two that are commonly used are the brief and nick metrics. And this metric do not use a full reference of the original. They just look at the image and rate it in terms of quality. Basically what they do is uh, they learn some distribution of uh, the pixels and, uh, and uh, the content of natural images. And then they rate a naturalness of your image. Because uh, when you compress an image, adding artifacts, those artifacts do not look absolutely natural. They are blocks, uh, basically. They are lines, straight lines. Straight lines do not really exist in nature. So how do we perform when you compare uh, a network uh, trained uh, with GAN against uh, a network trained with SSIM. And how do this metric perform compared against a SIM metric or a peak signal noise ratio that are full reference metrics by themselves? So here is a, a table that compares them. So JPEG 10 means it's a network trained with SSIM. And then, uh, well, you can expect that if a network was trained using SIM loss, and then uh, you measure it using SIM, uh, it's very good usually. But of course, but it also performs very well uh, if you use uh, the peak signal noise ratio metric. Instead, uh, our approach based on GANs perform a little bit worse. On the other hand, if you compute the metric using Nick or Brisk that, as I said, are no reference metric, so the judgment is, is made only looking at, at one image without looking at the original one, the gun-based metric performs better. This is somewhat related to the fact that humans liked it more. Probably the details that are added by the network now are more natural to the human eye 
as we have seen with the subjective evaluation, but also to these metrics that have been trained to recognize natural images. There is a funny thing is that uh, the naturalness of the images that have been recreated with our GAN network is higher than the original images. This means that probably the network is hallucinating some details, probably it's adding a little bit more fur on cats, it's adding a little bit more hair on humans, it's adding a little bit more details that make the image uh, like uh, supernatural. So we could even think of using these networks as a sort of a beautifier filter on, on, some, uh, on some application. But again, this type of metrics will be yeah, more or less good to understand the human eye. But uh, probably more and more videos will be watched by machines, like surveillance videos, for example. So we are interested in evaluating how the reconstructed uh, images and videos uh, have an effect on computer vision algorithms. Instead of just simply classifying the content of, a, of an image that is nowadays a very, very basic task in computer vision, let's try something that is a little bit harder, that is detect where objects are within an image. So here we have just taken an off-the-shelf algorithm and evaluated it on Pascal Voc dataset. And it's interesting, evaluating the mean average precision to see how uh, the network uh, that have been created with GAN help a lot the computer vision algorithm to detect where objects are. And this effect is stronger and stronger as the image is and the video is more and more compressed. Okay, detecting the object is interesting, but uh, there are other tasks that are more semantic, so more similar to the way we think and perceive images. Image captioning that was uh, mentioned before by Paige. So, Again, we have taken an off-the-shelf uh, um, captioning uh, algorithm and we have tested it uh, on uh, compressed images and on restored images. It's interesting because uh, when you go to compress very hard, this image of a dog, the captioning algorithm gets completely confused. I can't understand why it says a statue of a woman wearing a Christmas tie. Why it's a Christmas tie, God knows. Instead, uh, with our gun, uh, the description is uh, more similar to the high quality. So it means that we are really helping uh, computer vision algorithms to understand what is uh, the semantic content of an image. This is just a qualitative example. Of course, uh, there is like a ton of examples uh, of measurements that are typically performed to evaluate, uh, to evaluate uh, how images have been captioned and how you can see here Basically, uh, our restored images have a performance that is very similar to that of the original image and much higher than that of the compressed image. Again, uh, to give a qualitative analysis, you can see that uh, this image, uh, the foam is exchanged for white floor. Probably, I, I do not know. On the other hand, our restored image, it's white foam. White tree, I, I wonder if the, here the network is hallucinating probably due to the high uh, frequency artifacts uh, and uh, instead, uh, okay, it's uh, blue water, uh, there is a, a water spray and in the end a couple of people sitting next to a Christmas tree, like, completely foolish, a man riding wave on a surfboard in the ocean. Okay, now it makes sense. Okay, how does it perform on videos? Because I've shown you all the images. Here is a nice example, I hope it's nice uh, and I hope you agree with me about the restoration. This is the restored image. So that face that you see has been recreated from that compressed face. Here is compressed, you see all the artifacts due to compression, all the blocks. Here is the restored one. Have you seen on the face, on the dashboard? Okay, very compressed image. Compression artifacts are very bad in, in, in uh, damaged scenes. You like this? Or you prefer this one? You prefer this one, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, 
more tricks to compress more, adding super resolution. Adding super resolution, so having a, a neural network that is able to get a, a low resolution image, expand it, and then adding the rest of the, uh, of the um, artifacts remove uh, network that I have shown you, allow us uh, to reduce bandwidth by 10 times. So we have produced a 4K video from uh, 540 lines video, that means upscaling by four. We have tested it on a Meridian 4K, that is a standard video used also by Netflix uh, as a, it's like an hello world 4K video. And uh, we have uh, in this case used another metric that has been developed by Netflix uh, that uh, somewhat measures, combines uh, several, uh, several uh, um, uh, objective measurements inside an SVM and regresses uh, a quality factor. And uh, we have seen that uh, yeah, you compare it uh, to an H.264, we spare 10 times uh, the um, bandwidth. Of course, uh, we are unable to get the same quality of 10 times, but uh, we are able to pretty much improve uh, with respect to the quality of a very reduced uh, frame. So using uh, this set of networks, uh, it's possible to create stuff like this. The 540p image on the left, uh, is recreated in higher resolution. You see, we have restored that this is a detail of a shirt. We can uh, recreate the details of the, of the drawing of the colors of the, of the shirt. And especially on more natural images like uh, the human face. You see the eye on the left, how it's reconstructed. This has given us an idea. Why not learn a gun for the faces, for uh, video conferencing? Guns are very good uh, in uh, restoring, if uh, you have a, a more limited uh, world uh, to, to deal with. Uh, so if the distribution is simpler and the faces are for sure a, a typical case for application of guns. In the first day during the tutorial, probably you have seen how faces are created by networks. In this case, uh, we want to take these faces and using our network, we create these faces. Uh, we have, uh, using uh, uh, H.264 talking head video, a reduction of 150 times, maintaining the quality. Moreover, we can run 24 frames per second on an iPhone X using this network. Well, how do we do that? We take our network, the real duty was done by the residual blocks, and uh, the idea is substitute those residual blocks with the inverted residual block that have been introduced in mobile network, mobile net. These residual blocks are basically more efficient in terms of computation and in terms of memory. So the idea of an inverted residual block is to go from a narrow layer to larger layer and then compress again them. So that's an example of the code uh, using uh, Keras. And here is just to visualize uh, how they work. Uh, basically, uh, we do not, like in the lower image, we do not perform uh, a convolution on all the layers of the input, uh, but uh, we perform uh, convolutions on the different channels, and then we follow with uh, a one-by-one -one convolution that combines them. And uh, this reduces greatly the number of computations. Okay, so just substituting uh, the inverted residual blocks, uh, we retrain using uh, a data set that is made for high resolution images. We have added a little bit more of, uh, of data augmentation techniques. This is an example of what we have used for this. Uh, so, okay, with, compared uh, with the simple example I've shown you, there are some batch normalization layers that are layers to help the network to learn better. We use uh, ReLU6, that is an activation function that is a little bit different, but uh, this is just to give you an idea. And here are some results of uh, these faster networks. You can see that we can go up to 42 frames per second. These numbers were taken 42 frames per second on uh, Titanix, instead of four. 
<laughs> uh, frame per seconds using uh, residual blocks. I'm skipping uh, because I don't have time. Uh, an example, this is an example of uh, uh, the network running on an iPhone X. So we have captured the video. For the images, this is the video. You have seen when I have turned on uh, the, uh, the network. So it's uh, pretty much nice because uh, luckily uh, the faces where we have uh, the fur. <laughs> we have hair, we have bird, we have the details of the skin. So you can see immediately the face is more natural, absolutely natural. So the conclusion is guns are great for image announcement. Uh, training allows domain specialization, as you have seen. Do not trust signal-based metrics to evaluate uh, your results, because uh, usually you'll get blurred images. The best thing is if you have humans to make evaluations, then use semantic tasks, because they are more similar to humans. Then use no reference metrics, because they tell you how natural. And then uh, use full reference. Uh, and with this, I've concluded. Okay, thank you very much, Marco. Nice talk. So we ran out of time, but uh, there is a break now, so probably we have time for, for one question. Someone? Yeah. Thank you a lot for the interesting presentation. I was toying with something similar using other published works and I was wondering whether this stuff was published anywhere, like some papers or maybe sources. Like yeah, many papers. <laughs> many papers. Uh, our papers are, okay, from the top to the fifth one. And, you know, and so all details and additional experiments, uh, you can find uh, all them there some reference source of implementation like somewhere or is it closed? So, uh, sorry? The, the source like what you showed the, the pictures like the definitions of TensorFlow batch blocks and stuff is it available anywhere like on GitHub uh, or something? Uh, actually you'll find the plenty of tutorials uh, and the implementations uh, for example uh, for MobileNet uh, there are many implementations for Keras so you just uh, have to get uh, those blocks uh, uh, or the code that I've shown you is uh, the basic building blocks. Uh, and uh, uh, if you learn or you know uh, enough uh, about, uh, the, um, about the convolution and neural networks, uh, I can say that uh, these, uh, this image uh, provides enough information because it tells you what is the size of the convolution, how many filters, what is the striding. So from the papers and uh, really from the code of these slides, uh, you can uh, recreate, uh, you can recreate uh, this network. Thanks, thanks a lot. Okay, let's thank this.